भद्रम कर्णे शृणुयाम देवा भद्रंग पश्येक्षजत्रा स्थिरंगुवागम सस्तनु व्यशेम देवितयदायु स्वस्ती न इंद्रो वृद्ध स्रवा स्वस्ती न पूषा विश्व स्वस्तीर्णस्ताक्षोरिष्टने स्वस्ति नो बृहस्पतिर्दा ओ शांत शांत शांति हरि मे बी हियर विथ अवर यस वॉट इज ऑस्पिशियस मे बी सी विथ अवर आईज वॉट इज ऑस्पिशियस वाइल प्रेइंग विथ स्टडी लिम्स मे बी अटेन द लाइफ स्पैन अलॉटेड टू अस may indra bestow well being on us may pushan the god of the earth who is all knowing bestow well being on us may garuda the destroyer of evil bestow well being on us may brihaspati also bestow well being on us om shanti 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 so in the last class we were studying the fifth and the sixth mantras of the second chapter of second part of mundaka upanishad in the sixth mantra uh, what we studied that we will quickly recapitulate before we proceed to the seventh and the eighth mantra so what the sixth mantra uh, we start studied is stating ara iva rathanabho sanghata yatra nadya sa esha antah charate bahudha jayamanah ओम इति एवं ध्यायथ आत्मानं स्वस्ति व पराय तमस परस्थात सो अरा इव रथनाभो संहथा यत्र नाड्य सो लाइक द स्पोक्स फैसंड इन द नेवल ऑफ ए चैरियट व्हील सो इन द लास्ट क्लास वी डिस्कस्ड इट बट टुडे वी विल डिस्कस इट फ्रॉम सम डिफरेंट पर्सपेक्टिव that what are these spokes which has been spoken of is connected to as if the navel of the chariot will is spoken of in the modern psychology they speak of mental modules they say we don't have a single mind there are innumerable minds which all together constitute the mind which defines a particular personality then how the mind is working they say very interesting that it's not that we decide there are innumerable mental modules each module has its own stimuli response conditioning for a particular stimuli it is going to respond in a particular way that is fixed but once it responds it gives us a sensation that i have decided actually it is all the mental modules who are taking those decisions now the question is which mental module will get activated is there someone who is commanding that this is the mental module which should get activated nothing as such then again the decision comes to us it's not that uh someone is there is one mind which is dictating the other mental modules the mental modules as per the circumstances get activated by themselves it depends on the circumstances as we discussed previously in many occasions that the same person the same you when you are at home you are a different person you may be a loving parent a loving father or a loving mother your uh nicely relating with your children with your family the same one when he is in his office may be a totally different person there we will find the stimuli response has changed the same person when he is with his friends again he is different you may think that it is you who are deciding actually it's not so there are various mental modules which gets activated as per the circumstances and they have the fixed stimuli response conditioning 
and they respond, making you believe you are taking the decisions yourself. But it never so happens. There are innumerable such mental modules. As per the situation, they activate. And that's how we operate in this life. Now, the question is how those mental modules developed. But we can easily understand that when, just take a small microbe, the first evolute of life. From the Vedantic perspective or from the yoga perspective, we can say when the conscious principle got associated with that small psychophysical existence, it starts saying its reflection in that small entity. That's the Ajnana. It starts seeing the reflection, it identifies with the reflection and it thinks I am that. That's the Ajnana, ignorance to identify oneself with the reflection. From the ignorance comes asmita, the ego, the sense of ego, this limited individuality. Once it comes, after that, the three kleshas, as has been spoken of in the Yoga Sutras, that ensues, that follows. What are they? Raga, Dvesha, Abhinivesha. From where they come? As the conscious principle, which is beyond all limitation, which is eternal. Now, when it's reflected in the psychophysical existence and from behind, the reflection is echoing that you're eternal, but that eternity cannot be experienced in the psychophysical existence. We know the body is a change, is a flow, and it is going to perish. That echo now wants to realize that eternity in this psychophysical existence. And that's how the life starts evolving. When it hears that echo, now what it finds, there are some circumstances which is favorable for his psychophysical existence. The one who is saying you're eternal, it tries now to adopt those favorable circumstances so that it can go on with his life. And there are certain circumstances which are not favorable. So I try to run away from it. I fight it or I have a flight response to it. This fight and flight response comes. So either we are obsessed by it or there is fight and flight response. Now this speaks of the formation of mental modules from the very beginning, from the very inception of life. Because of ignorance, when I get identified with the body-mind complex, the ego evolves from that raga, dvesha, abhinivesha, obsession, fight and flight response that comes into picture. And this, as per the circumstances, is creating various, various mental modules. Wherever the circumstance is favorable, I respond in a particular way. In a microbe, if it sees some nutrient, in a petri dish you are seeing in the mic through the microscope, that in the petri dish, you will find if you put a drop of nutrient in the center, the microbes will move towards it. The response is towards the center. If you put some toxin, it will move away from it. That's the fight and flight response. So based on the circumstance, the responses are developing. And these responses with fixed situation, the fixed stimuli with a fixed response, these actually speaks of the formation of the mental modules. Such innumerable mental modules have formed. Our, our personality is constituted of the conglomeration of all those mental modules, which is favorable, which has resulted in my birth. So now here we will try to understand what it is being spoken of as ara eva rathanabhav sanghata yatra nadya. So all these mental modules are like the spikes. And what is the nadya, the navel of the chariot? That's your ego. The sense, the paramatman getting reflected in this psychophysical existence is creating this idea that I am this limited psychophysical existence. That creates the ego. The ego is the navel with which all the spokes are connected. But after all, the ego has to be, what's that? The self has to be there. The self reflected in the psychophysical existence constitutes the ego. So it is the self 
being, being reflected in the psychophysical existence now finds expression through all the mental modules as a various stimuli response conditionings. So that's being indicated by here, this ara iva rathanabho, sanghatha yatra nadvya, ya esha anta charate vahudha jayamana. So vahudha means there are so many innumerable these feelings, responses. From the responses, the feelings develop, the emotions develop. So all this behind that, if you go back, it is a self. The self, because of ignorance, finds expression as asmita. That asmita, when reacts to the various situations of life in the form of raga, dvesha, vinivesha, in the form of attachment, aversion, and fright, and flight, this, and this fright means fear. From that, these mental modules has formed and they are all hooked to the, the ego. Om iti evam dhyayatha atmanam. So what's the way to again get established in myself to come out from this, this uh, the will of the chariot which constitutes my personality. My personality is like the, the will of the chariot which has various spokes, various mental modules fixed to the ego. How to come of it? Om iti evam dhyayata atman. Meditate on the atman holding unto the vachaka, the syllable which represents the self. That's the om. A uma. Merging in the silence is om. We won't go to the details. What's the idea? That when in this limited state of existence, there are three states. Either we are awake or we are dreaming or we are in the deep sleep state. All the experiences that we have in all these three states, behind that, the self is there. That Om merges in the silence, all the three states at last merges in that silence, means in your self, the self is, being is finding expression through all these three states. Aum is the waking, the dream state and the deep sleep straight. So behind that, the self is. When you are chanting Om, what it is doing? You are constantly thinking that I am not the body, not the mind, not the senses, not the various feelings. I say I am happy, I am sad, uh, I am angry. All these things are not me. As per the situation, the mental modules have been activated and the reactions with which I'm getting identified is making me feel that I am angry, I am happy, I am sad. And all those feelings are coming. But I am not all those things. When I am chanting Om, I am negating the idea that I am this limited psychophysical existence. That I am the Atman, I am the Brahman. The every chanting of Om should be followed by that reflection, that tat japam, tat artha bhavanam. That's how we have studied even in the Yoga Sutra. That when you are doing japa, it's not mechanical. Tat artha bhavanam, the significance of it. That enables us to create a new mental module. All these mental modules by default I have. Through this practice, the Upanishads, the Vedas, their efficacy is here. That it speaks the way out of the sense, or if the knowledge was only limited to the senses, there was no need for the scriptures. The scriptures opens up the portal for the world, which is beyond the senses. It is, takes us to the super sensory uh, level of existence where the self alone abides. From there, it's being spoken of that you are not the body, not the mind, not the senses. When I constantly contemplating on this idea, very interesting. It is the mind which is saying I am not the mind. So I am still within the domain of ignorance. But I have started creating a mental module which will help me to get rid of all the other mental modules. How? Because all the mental modules are having the ego as its source. That it takes this limited psychophysical existence to be the fact of life to be the reality. Based on that, all the responses have developed. Now, when you are constantly chanting Om, 
with the idea behind it that you are neither the body, not the mind, not the senses, not the various feelings. You're constantly negating. So you're creating a mental module which is actually nullifying all other mental modules. So that's the only way to get rid of all the mental modules. That's what in the scriptures they have spoken of. That there are two types of Ajnana. Tula Ajnana and Mula Ajnana. When I'm looking at the flower, what it is, there's an ignorance. That ignorance is Tula Ajnana. That is a relative ignorance. That I don't know what it is. My mind, that it comes, the red flower comes as a suggestion through my eyes, through my nose as the smell, fragrance. And it goes to my, my this, the brain, which is the organ of the mind. Brain is not the mind. The mind works through the brain. So, and there the perception centers being activated. They actually throw out the color. They throw out the fragrance. The fragrance is not out there. It is the mind which is projecting. The external world is a suggestion. And these all, the self, through all those projections, as if moves out and envelops the object to remove its ignorance and the knowledge is revealed. That's how the Tula Ajnana is being removed. So it's, so that's why it is very interesting. When we, when we study the Vedanta for the first time, we find, oh, this is all uh, spoken of, which has nothing to do with the science. But at the present day, as the science is developing, we find the Vedantic way of interpretation is so much telling with the science. Just to give you an example, we have an idea that how the perception happens, the red flower is there outside. From outside, something is coming within, and that's what I'm perceiving. My mind is like a mirror, just reflecting what is there outside. That's what we all feel. But now the science has developed quite enough to say, even you will understand, that the red, the red flower, that this example which we give again and again, with that we can actually understand all perceptions. That how we are seeing the red flower, the redness is not out there. The science will say when the light falls on the red flower, there are so many wavelengths of light which are falling on that flower. How the color comes, all the wavelengths are absorbed, a particular wavelength is emanated back. The, it is just a wavelength, it has no color. It comes and strikes your eyes. The function of the light is over there. The light never enters your brain. Now, the moment it touches your retina, that particular wavelength produces a particular type of nervous impulse. That nervous impulse, when it reaches the color perception center, the color is emanated from there, is produced there to envelop the thing. Now the mind has to be activated by the self for the mind to project that color. A dead, a dead body just lying with the mind. They, even if the eyes are open, nothing is seen. A person who is just uh, unconscious, whose mind is not uh, is active, he's not seeing anything, though the light is entering. It is when the self is activating the mind and then this color is projected. Like that, all the perceptions are happening. So it is a self through the mind and the senses as if it's projected out to create this world. And that's how all the agyanas are being removed. But the ignorance about my own self by which the ego has been formed, for that, a special type of vritti has to be produced. That is the brahmakara vritti. Constantly chanting, constantly contemplating on the idea that I am not the body, not the mind, not the senses. I am the Atman. Aham brahmasmi. This is the thing which gradually develops that detachment that all the things of the life which are going on is because of the default mode in which I have been born. As they were, I was born with all those things and the body as has been spoken of in the Bhagavad Gita, guna guneshu vartanta. As per the stimuli response, as per the stimuli, the body is responding. The, ex, the stimuli is the external guna, the response is the internal guna. That's how is this are interacting. But I am beyond that, the self. When I'm constantly contemplating on that, as the other's mental modules has been produced, how out of necessity, when I, we have done the thing repeatedly, then it has become something like a reflex action, automated. Now you don't have to decide. It automatically happens. So here also, 
this when we go on chanting it becomes habitual and it is such a such a vritti which is actually negating the idea that you are limited body mind sense and that's how first it gets rid of all the mental modules it negates them and at last that para vairagya has to ensure that even this the mental module which is saying that i am not the body not the mind not the senses is itself a mental module that at last also has to fall off it also has to fall off because in uh, mundaka upanishad we will come to a word that who is a realized soul much later in the third part the word will come nativadi na ativadi means even one who has cleansed his mind from all the mental modules by constantly contemplating on the idea that i am brahman still is holding on to the mind so when he says i am brahman what he is doing he is actually doing ativada means ativada means he is speaking something which is beyond his realization vada means to speak the speech ati means which transcends because he is yet to be established in the atman that last mental module also has to fall and that comes through para vairagya how the para vairagya comes supreme detachment the detachment comes when i have got rid of all the mental modules by this one mental module then what happens all the biases falls off all the mental modules actually makes us biased just to give an example in vedanta that nice example is given that how the biases are formed suppose there is a stump in the stump of a tree in one corner of a park in the twilight hours in the dusk hours you will find that as per our bias we don't see what it is a lover who is in search of his beloved sees it to be his beloved a thief who is running away from the police is scared of the police from a distance he thinks it to be the police the police who is in search of the thief thinks from a distance it is the thief the child whose game is over plays over now it's time to go back home is in search of his parents most probably parent is waiting somewhere to take him back to home from a distance think it to be the parent and the parent who is in search of the child thinks it to be the child so what it's actually speaking of as per my bias i am seeing the stump in so many varied ways so it is our bias which paints our vision it is our bias which is forcing us to wear a colored glass and look at the world so as long as we have all those mental modules our vision is bound to be tainted we may think i'm seeing correctly but it never happens all our clash fight struggle is because of these various perspectives which we have developed as per our bias in this world no one thinks i am wrong you are and the other person is right everyone thinks i am right you go to the jail where someone is being detained is waiting just for the capital punishment and go and take an interview you will find such interview even in the youtube they will always say i was correct i never did anything wrong it's the external situations my parents are responsible the society is responsible for what has happened to me where i am why it happens so no one thinks i am wrong it is a fight of the perspective as per my as per our this uh, biases which we have developed because of our inordinate desires that restricts our vision when one has got rid of all the mental modules and is holding on to one mental module that is aham brahmasmi that is still the mind but that mind has got freed from all the bias so it can see the reality face to face what it sees very important thing one is that in yoga sutra it has been mentioned it speaks of jati smaratva that so many births i have passed through when your mind is full free from all the bias the mind expands even in your day to day life you will find that when i am busy with my day to day work in the morning i have that the mother is have to go to, she herself is working she has to prepare the food for the child for husband take care of the household and then she also has to go for work extremely busy mind is focused to what she is doing 
now after the work when others are yet to return she has came back first she is sitting and relaxing and now the mind expands what has happened yesterday and the, all the worries tensions all those things can come when you are free you can go to the past you can think of the future the mind expands similarly when all the biases has fallen off our mind has store of experiences but we are so much concerned with the present that they are not visible to us at present but they are there to give a common example suppose in a room with a projector you in a screen you are just projecting some picture some movie and suddenly someone comes and opens all the windows and you doesn't you don't see that what is being projected on the screen isn't it there it is still there but the external light overshadows what is being projected similarly in the subconscious mind all the past experiences are there but as we are constantly dealing with our present sensory experiences either seeing or thinking of them the mind is overshadowed as is flooded by all the immediate experiences the one who has contemplated has closed the all the senses the windows and even when after closing there is no thought which is disturbing him they have all been silenced now the past like a projector projects on the screen the past becomes visible even you will find this jati smarat when yoga sutra has been spoken of in buddha's life the jati smarat came just before he went to that realization and when the jati smarat comes then the para vairagya comes why you just can see how many lives we have wasted we thought that all this worldly endeavors is going to give me fulfillment we went for all this uh, developing skills developing academic having academic excellences we went for some job everything we have done and then life has its own course the old age came every, whatever we gained whatever nature gave us we have to again renounce nature took away everything and we again have to go empty handed and that's how it was continuing life after life this is what the limited existence the existence in the ego ego with the ego at last speaks of there is no no as such real fulfillment what's the waste of energy because of ignorance we are going through life after life that's why swami vivekananda in one of the places is saying that how many lives you have wasted you think that the spiritual endeavor is of no use but why bother you have already wasted so many life why not waste one life by giving to the spiritual endeavor because already you have wasted and if you think that this is going to be a waste this is just one among this innumerable lives what's the harm but it is not wasted that's the thing he wants to say that you have wasted so many life why not give one life for this ideal so here also this is the idea when that one mental model is there and you just the past is revoked you see it then that para vairagya comes that extreme renunciation why hold on to this in this small individuality and then even that mental module which is saying you are brahma then that realization comes that i am still holding on to this but it is very difficult to leave that unless you have that para vairagya with that experience now you can easily leave that off and that takes you to that ultimate realization and that's why this is the path which has been spoken of at last the guru is saying resort to it know it for certain that after you resort to it my blessing is there swasti that swasti that may you cross his blessing may you cross beyond the sea of darkness by resorting to this type of practice the practice is uh, seems to be simple but it is not that simple as sri ramakrishna used to say tablar bol mukhe bola shohoj hate ana kothin it is very easy to recite the rhythm of the tabla of the percussion but to really bring it in hand you need the skill so just to say that go on chanting om by reflecting on its meaning that will take you beyond all the this meshes of ignorance it's easy to say but that entails real intense practice and for that the blessing is something which is required and that's what guru is doing the finding that he has already developed the this yearning for going beyond this limited existence 
his blessing that resort to this path, know it for certain. This and this alone can take you beyond this cycle of birth and death. So that's the idea which has been spoken of in the sixth mantra. So with this, let us resort now um, just uh, to go to the next mantra, the seventh mantra, that we have to resort to the chanting of the Om and the best way of doing it is to think of the Brahman is sitting in your heart. Visualize him sitting to be the heart and then go on chanting the Om. That will uh, ensure the liberation is the process is accelerated. Brahman should be contemplated in the lotus of the heart. So that's being indicated in the seventh mantra. What's that? Yeah, Sarvagya Sarvavit Asya Esha Mahima Bhavi Divye Brahmapure Hi Esha Vyomni Atma Pratishthita Manomaya Prana Sharira Neta Pratishthita Anne Ridayam Sannidhaya Tat Vigyanena Paripashyanti Dhira Ananda Rupam Amritam Yat Vivati yeah, Sarvagya Sarvavit. So he is omniscient in general as well as all knowing in detail. What it means? That when we have an idea that someone is the boss, that somehow we have the idea that the Brahman is the ultimate boss of the entire universe. And with that, what the idea comes? That as in the office, the work which I do, as a subordinate in details. Most probably the boss doesn't know that what I'm doing in details. He has a general idea that what's the work all are doing. But if he has to uh, understand the details, he has to just as if ask the person who has, is in charge of that, the subordinate who is in charge of that particular aspect of the work. It's a huge group work anywhere we go. The CEO most probably has an overall idea, but day to day, the details, he has to even just ask the subordinate to explain the entire thing. So the, that's what is the, with the idea of the boss we have, that he has an overall idea, but for the specific thing, most probably he doesn't know that, that the one, the Brahman, who is the Lord of the entire universe, how can he know the inner feelings of mine this, that, that what is going on within me. So he knows that's here, that's to resort to negate that type of idea. That his, his omniscient doesn't mean he knows everything in general. Even he knows everything in detail to the specific. So that's what the difference between the two words, Sarvagya, Sarvavit. Sarvagya means one who is omniscient in general. And Sarvavit, not only that, he knows everything in detail, in minute details. What's the idea? Again, the same. As Brahman has been projected as this universe. So the each and every uh, this details of the projection must be known to him because it is he only who has been projected. It's not that he is something extraterrestrial sitting and commanding. It is not from top to bottom. It is from the bottom to top. It is from within to without. So if the boss is just sitting outside, he's apart from me, there is of course the question that he may know everything in general, but not in detail. But the one who is ruling from within, he knows everything in general as well as in detail. So yeah, Sarvagya Sarvavit, Asya Esha Mahima Bhuvi. So what is the Mahima? Why is he glorious? Because he has absolute control over everything. Whether it is the uh, Virat, the magnanimous universe, or it is the details within me, the way that my mind is working. Everywhere I will find it is he who is the boss. Why is the boss? Because the laws which he has uh, articulated through the creation, there is no one who can go beyond the law. The sun has to just uh, the, all the celestial body has to go on moving in the same path as has been directed by him. The, all the objects, the way the gravitation, in, in those days, they also just 
uh, spoke of the planetary movements, but even we know nowadays the gravitational laws has to be obeyed. And as it is obeyed, that's why we can with exact precision, just uh, what you say that, uh, that we can launch the rocket and it can go and land on the moon or in the Mars. We can do the soft landing without crashing. How is it possible? Because the laws are universal. The magnetic, this electromagnetic laws, anything you will find is universal. What is applicable here is applicable everywhere. There are exceptions, but we are speaking in general. It's, there are some laws which the universe is following for the time being. From the chaos, the order has came. And again, it may go to the chaos, but the order did come. Why it came? Because everything would have been just chaos. There wouldn't have been any order. Why that even that order which is temporary, it comes because the inception at the very beginning, we find the force with which it has happened is calculated. Just the example we can give, even if I say the big bang is the beginning of creation, just, just let us take that as, as the science wants to say. The big bang, if it had happened in a bit more force, everything would have been dispersed. The galaxies wouldn't have formed. If the force was a little less, everything would have immediately collapsed into a big black hole. Creation wouldn't have been possible. The force was such, it is very narrow margin within which it has happened that this creation is possible. That speaks of the stability behind this tremendous force which is working. You may say that was an accident, that accidentally it has happened. But there are so many other forces the atom is formed, There's every, each and every element is formed, the atom is formed, where we would find the weak nuclear forces that within the nucleus, very interesting. We say the protons repel, but within the small nucleus, infinitely small nucleus, all the protons are all in, just in a compact way they're staying. How is it possible that they say when the subatomic particles are very near, instead of repelling, they have an attraction, there's a strong nuclear force. So that keeps them binding. When the distance is a bit more, then they will start repelling. So this, then outside the electrons are moving. The electrons are being attracted by this nucleus. Now, as it is, a, there's a distance, there's attraction. If it was too near, then this opposite would have been repelled. Now there has to be a ratio between the strong nuclear force and this big, weak nuclear force. If it was more, atoms wouldn't have formed. If it is less, atoms wouldn't have formed. So like that, innumerable accidents have happened in exact precision. That speaks how strong the boss is. The law which I have stated, no one can break. Within us, <clears throat> when I sit and just say, God is not there, it's all bogus nonsense. Just to say this sentence, your heart beats would be exactly the way it beats. If it starts palpitating more, yeah, <clears throat> you won't be existing, you will die. All the hormones, the enzymes, innumerable, <clears throat> the secretions are going on within the body. They are happening in such precision that even in laboratory with all our conscious mind, we say all those things are happening unconsciously. With all our conscious, intelligent mind in laboratory, we cannot do that in that, with that precision. With that precision, everything is happening. So that speaks of the law. So that he, that behind, there's once he's as he's standing with the rod, just his presence makes everything that go in an orderly fashion. That rhythm is there behind the creation. That rhythm, the, from the word rhythm, the English word rhythm has came. That Om finds expression as rim, rim. The ultimate reality, the Brahman, finds expression as rim. Rim is the vachaka of shakti, as energy. And that energy is not chaotic. It is following some rhythm. That's is expressed as rhythm. Om, rim, rhythm. This rhythm, this rhythm is satya. Why it is satya? Because no one in the phenomenal existence can break it. The sun has to move in its path the same way it has been moving for aeons together. So that's the thing which speaks of the Mahima. The self, which finds expression as the creation, it finds expression through that rhythm, through the laws, whether it is physical laws or the moral laws. No one can break it. So even in the Brihad, that's why in the Brihadaranak Upanishad, it has been mentioned, Etasya va Aksharasya Prashashane. He is the ruler. 
Gargi Dhyava Prithivu Vidrite Tishthata. Under his mighty rule, this has been possible that all the celestial bodies, the earth, are all held in the positions because of the mighty rule of that ultimate self, which when finds expression as the creation, finds expression as the laws. Otherwise, it would have been just simply chaotic. It would have not been possible. The sun and the moons are held in the positions. Surya Chandramasa Vidrita Utishthata. In the Brihadaranaka Parishad that speaks of, that speaks of his glory. Esha Mahima Bhuvi. Divye Brahmapurehi Esha Vyomni Atma Pratishthita. So this, when I think of the self who is the ruler of the entire world, immediately my eyes goes up in the sky that there must be someone sitting there as the ruler. He's extraterrestrial. As in science nowadays, they have started saying when they find that the world is actually a virtual reality, in many ways it can be understood that it is to a certain extent virtual. And they have started joking but it's a world of virtual reality with there are, that there are uh, what you say the ways which we cannot be explained so many things are going on so jokingly they say there are some parallel universe where this small in some another parallel universe a small little girl of the primary school just have programmed a world of virtual reality of what we are that's what Ms. Jokingly they say. The, and why I'm just, uh, uh, just relating to that, the idea is it is as if something extraterrestrial. So in Upanishads, they say it is not extraterrestrial. Divye Brahma Purehi Esha Vyomni Atma Pratishtita. This, the wonderful creation with the, all the laws which you're seeing is not outside there. It is here within. It is here. It is in the heart of your hearts. Divye Brahmapure. This it is in the, the city of Brahman. Brahmapura means the city of Brahman is in the luminous space of your heart. Why the luminous space? As we have mentioned previously, that heart is the center of the feelings. That's why it is equated with the mind. And the mind and is a luminous. So it is a luminous mind which is centered in your heart. Within that, the self is. The, again, the question is: the self is omnis, omnipresent. How can it be just in the heart? So to understand that, let us take an allegory. Light is everywhere, but to see it, I need the eyes. Sound is everywhere. When I'm just speaking, it's everywhere. To hear it, its center is the ears. Similarly, the self is everywhere, but in our, as a human being in this life, he has to be felt in our heart. As Sri Ramakrishna used to say that, the heart of a devotee is the God's living space. In your house, there you have access to each and every corner of your house. You can go anywhere. But when the guest comes, you meet him in your living room. Not, you won't be taking your guest everywhere. It is a particular place. So the God meets the devotee, the aspirant in the heart. What some what beautiful words Ramakrishna say that the Devotee's heart is a God's drawing room, God's living room. So that's the thing is indicated in the Upanishad. Divye Brahmapure Esha Vyomni Atma Pratishtita. It's very significant. When you are meditating something on the heart, heart is the center of emotions. From the emotions, that are all the love which is linked with our emotions. So when you're meditating on the heart, you're easily connecting with your emotion. And know it for certain, it is the emotion which speaks of contemplation. It's not the will. With all our willpower, we may try to stop the distraction, but the meditation can never be that effective. The meditation really becomes effective when I've developed love for it. Just the way the mother never meditates on the child, lest she forgets her. The love makes her think of the child always in all the moments, whatever she may be doing. The love makes the meditation, the contemplation spontaneous. She's actually meditating on the child spontaneously without any effort because the love is there. Wherever the love is there, the meditation, the real meditation happens. Without love, it never happens. So that's why meditate on the center of emotion so that your contemplation gets connected with your emotion. It's very important that there, you know, there are some mental patients, the psychopaths, they, when uh, 
I exactly forgot a particular type of psychopath. They develop a, part, a very peculiar feeling. They think that all their relatives are imposters. Seeing the mother, suddenly she will, he will say, he's looking like my mother, he's not my mother. What happens? When our perceptions, when we, when we are perceiving, it is not a very simple thing. That is not, I'm not just seeing the mother. To see the person, that so many piecemeal perceptions has to conglomerate. Along with that, to feel it is my mother, we have some emotional centers. Along with the perceptual centers, the emotional centers also conglomerate. That's why when I am passing by the road, others building are others building. When I come to my near house, immediately the feeling comes, it is my house. The emotion gets linked with the perception. And that gives a strong feeling. So when I am meditating on Brahman, all my other feelings are having that emotional attachment. And if I just keep this as a willpower, as just a matter of introspection, without trying to relate with the emotion, it's very weak, very fragile. It has to get tagged with the emotion to really encounter all other, all other mental modules. So that's why contemplate on the heart. So that this idea that I am the Brahman, or even if you're meditating on God, it has to get bound with the emotion. Then only that idea becomes, has that strength to encounter the all other. Otherwise, all other ideas are linked with emotions. Whatever ideas we have, you will find it linked with the emotions and that gives the strength. So to have the strength, it has to be meditated on the center of your emotions, the heart. So divya brahma pure hi esha vyomni atma pratishtita mano mayaha. So it is, the mind is active because of the self. His manomaya, prana sharira neta, prana, the, the, all the vitality. Behind that, it is, the, it is he who is the source of all the vitality. Because of him, the body is moving. That manomaya, we can understand that sitting here, when the rover is moving in the Mars, I find that all the feedback which it is giving, it speaks of the, it just speaks of information. I am sending some information as a feedback, I'm getting information. But when it is moving, it speaks of the prana. That I, this just with my, from here with the remote control, I can make it move it. It's moving. So that's the way the self, like a remote, is activating my mind, is activating my prana. And prana, sharira neta means when I leave one body and go to the next body, it is the self, which is the driving force behind it. The self activates the mind and then the mind can just, what you say that transmigrate. So this behind the process of transmigration, as it has already mentioned, sarvasya sarvavit. So here it is showing the details that in all the activities, in all your thoughts, in all your, uh, what you say, the expression of your energy, the vitality, even when you die from that, when you transmigrate, it is the self behind, be, 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 means without the self, nothing can be thought of. Pratishthita anne. Anna here means the body because the body is the product of food. So even in, in the body, in the, so here you will find that the self actually has been spoken as panchakosha has been spoken of. When, that when you are meditating, that ananda maya kosha, in, in that the self is identified. The self is identified with the vijnana maya kosha, with your conviction that you are the Atman, you are the Brahman. When your mind is distracted, it is going to the vagaries, then also it is the self which is being identified with your mind. It is a self which is identified with your prana. It is a self, again, which is identified with your body. That's why out of ignorance, I say, I am the body. I say, I am the mind. I am the senses. I am the vitality. It's on various level because of ignorance, this identification has, is happening. And behind that, actually the self and self alone is. It's because of ignorance, this identification is happening in the various uh, levels of our existence. That's being indicated by these two phrases. This manomaya, prana, sharira, neta, and then the next pratishthita, anne. But ridayam sannidhaya, that's the, from sitting there, he's getting connected to all. So go back, don't come, don't just project yourself out through the radius and get identified. Retrace back through the radius to go back to the center so that you can get hold of the self 
which alone is the reality. So Ridayam Sannihat, Tat Vigyanya, Paripash, knowing that, this knowing, they, have, they could have used the word Jnana, but they have used the word Vigyana. This knowing is not mere intellectual knowledge. Vigyana means realizing. Jnana means conceptual knowledge. Vigyana speaks of the, uh, this, the realization. It's no more conceptual, it is perceptual. As if you are perceiving, you are re relating to the truth face to face. As Shankaracharya used to say, Karatala Amala Kavar, the truth has become as a fruit in your hand. That speaks of Vigyana. So it is no more just an intellectual conviction. It has went to your realization. When that Vigyana happens, when it happens, Paripashyanti. Well, these prefixes are very important in Sanskrit. Just Pashyanti means to look. Why the, when the Paripra is used, it is not like looking with your eyes. Where, where all our perceptions, there is an object and there is a subject is relating to the object. But the subject relating to the subject, can it happen? To understand that the prefix Pari Pashyanti has been using. That you are absorbed, the self is absorbed in the self. There, and that also can lead to a realization which is neotic, which you cannot speak out. It's something unique. That's the, that's uh, even in uh, yeah, this William James, he told that all the mystic traditions of the world, though the language may be varied, they all speak of two things. There uh, are two important things. One is noetic and ineffable. That when I have experienced something, what I have experienced is ineffable. I cannot explain. As Sri Ramakrishna used to say, Kamun ghi na jamun ghi. If, you, if I give you uh, some clarified butter, some ghee to test, and I ask you, what's the test? Can you ever explain me the test of the ghee? It has a test. But as the attributes are lacking, that it is neither sweet nor sour, these are the attributes. There's, there is no such attributes by which I can explain the taste of the ghee. So it is something in, ineffable. I cannot explain. But at the same time, when, if, when, you, when I say that, please explain me the taste of ghee and you cannot explain, so I declare you have not tested the ghee at all. You cannot explain. Then you will say, no, I have tested. So that is noetic. It is, I have a conviction that I have experienced something. It is not mere imagination. It is my conviction, but it cannot be explained. And that speaks of the subject relating to the subject. That is the being indicated by the word paripashyanti. So it is not that I am not just having an intellectual knowledge. I have realized something that is vijnana. And for that, this realization is spoken of by the word paripashyanti. And that which I cannot speak of, which cannot be explained, that is avang manasagocharam, beyond mind, beyond senses. But it is something which gives me a sense of certitude in all the mystic traditions, we will find the mystics are speaking of that certitude. And that certitude gives them tremendous strength. When the world says you are speaking something which is not as per the doctrines and dogmas, you will be persecuted. They are ready to even face death because the truth has given the tremendous strength from the certitude that strength has come that nothing can kill me. These peoples are speaking nonsense. They have transcended the so-called the laws and rules, man-made laws and rules, and beyond, went, went beyond that. Standing there, they know that nothing can annihilate me. And they go on saying this truth, which they have seen as if face to face. So that's, who has done that? The dhira. The dhira is generally translated as wise, but the actual meaning of the word dhira is the one who is calm, tranquil. It is only the calm and the tranquil who is wise who has gone beyond the vagaries of the mind, beyond all the so-called the biases of the mind. Unless you go get rid of the vagaries, you cannot get rid of the bias. The bias has fallen off and that's why you become wise. I've seen the truth. And then what happens? Ananda rupam amritam yad bibhati. What the result of that realization? It takes you to eternity. You know that you are eternal amritam and that eternity is not like the present existence, where like a pendulum, sometimes we are in an ecstatic mood, sometimes we are depressed. And we feel as if through eternity, like a small straw particle being carried by the waves of the ocean, we have to travel 
there is no way out sometimes taking on the top of the wave sometimes on the ebb that's what we feel but here the upanishad is saying that once you realize the self which transcends your all the dualities you get established in that bliss the bliss which no one can take away from you actually we are there it is being filtered out because of the vagaries of the mind all the so called the biases the uh, these various uh, turbulences of the mind is filtering out that ananda swarupata that we are sat chit ananda swarup the sat swarupata sat what is sat that which is always existing which was which is which will be that no phase of time can interrupt its existence that which is trikal avadhita trikal means past present future these are three phases of time avadhita means vadhita means interruption avadhita means uninterrupted the one whose existence is not interrupted by any phase of time past present or future that sat that sat is again chit swarup that is not something inert it knows it exists just the way i know as long even in this limited existence i know i exist as a child it is the same i who is existing within me as the adult person so i am aware of the fact that i exist because why am i aware because i am the self whose is sat swarup who is chit swarup that is reflecting through my mind and complex that never gets filtered out what gets filtered out ananda swarupata because of the vagaries of the mind that's the thing which gets filtered out when i can stop the vagaries of the mind the mind becomes calm then the ananda swarupata also percolates my amness is always percolating whether i am happy whether i am dejected whether i am in sorrow that i am i always know i am that never gets filtered out only the ananda swarupata which is my nature that bliss it is always there it gets Uh, filtered out because of the vagaries of the mind the dhira the one who has co- com- completely subdued all the vagaries of the mind by his contemplation of the self has tranquilled his mind forever and that ananda swarupata vibhati it is if like an effulgence it comes out through his psychophysical existence the bliss of the self there's nothing to stop it filter it out and he knows is eternal and is eternal eternally blissful in that realization he gets established and that's what is being spoken of in this mantra so that's why meditate on the heart the emotional center and thinking of your real nature and that use the vachaka om for that meditation and that will take you what's the utility of that meditation because in the scripture they say unless we know the utility even a fool cannot be uh, motivated to do anything without there is an utility with all this knowledge if there is no utility why should why anyone will be interested in it so that's why this last phrase is important ananda rupam amritam yadipati that takes you to the realization that you are eternal and you are ever blissful and nothing can affect you and that gives the strength the strength with which the mystics of all the religions faced all the persecutions they got the the tremendous strength from that conviction that nothing can annihilate him and that that real him is eternal and is ever blissful so that's the idea we have the seventh mantra so we will proceed to the this upanishad you will find as it proceeds to the later chapters it's very very it's very powerful that's why swami used to say that if there is only one message which comes out from the upanishad it is strength and strength alone it gives the strength to really transcend the all the difficulties the sufferings of life the strength of the self and that's you will find is being reflected in this mantras so we will again continue with the next mantra in the next class with this we stop our discussion today thank you all namaskars